Hello everyone. Let me start off by saying I didn't intend on making this video, but I've had so many folks reach out to me after the tragic event that occurred right here in my home state of Ohio. People wondering if I was directly affected. Luckily, I'm on the complete opposite side of the state, but it's hard to say how far reaching the effects will be. And people wondering if I had any recommendations or thoughts on what had happened. For anyone who has not heard, there was a train derailment in Ohio earlier this month, and there are many, many concerns over the toxic substances that have made their way into the soil, the air, and the water. I didn't intend on making this video because I felt like I had nothing to offer. I don't have a solution solution, and I don't have any words of advice to offer to those who are immediately affected other than to say I am so, so sorry. But then I realized the truth of the matter is that we are all gardening in an increasingly toxic world. The immediate dangers of toxic train wrecks aside, we've all heard stories of gardeners ending up with loads of toxic topsoil, killer compost, or tainted straw. There's also been a sharp increase in heavy metal contamination in the soil since the beginning of the 20th century. I live in a predominantly agricultural area of Ohio. There is nothing for miles and miles but corn and soybean fields. And multiple times a year, those fields are doused with chemicals that end up in our water and our soil. Those crops are fed to our livestock, and they end up in a lot of the processed foods in the grocery stores. We have unusually high rates of cancer in this area, but we're told that there's no correlation, that everything is completely safe and normal. But you and I know this isn't normal. If you've connected to nature through your garden or feel yourself in any way a steward of the earth, you know in your heart and your gut that something isn't right. At times, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and defeated. I know I have. I've thought, what power do I have? One single person out here on my little plot of earth against what feels like a giant corrupt system that allows decisions to be made not by what's best for the earth or her people, but by the almighty dollar. How can I be a steward of my tiny plot of earth when all around me, acres and acres of farmland are monocropped and natural healthy ecosystems are essentially nuked. How can individuals in East Palestine and in similar towns all over the world have access to clean air and water and healthy soil to grow their own foods in? My answer to this is that you or I don't have that much power alone, but we have power in numbers. The more of us that care, the more of us that say, no, we're not going to accept this. The more of us that nurture and care for our own backyards and grow our own food and raise our own animals and don't accept that spraying toxic chemicals is the only answer. The more of us that will not accept the notion that soil contaminated with heavy metals, toxic runoff and chemicals is safe or normal. That's where the power to change comes from. While I definitely do not have the answers to a disastrous situation like East Palestine, I would highly encourage people, gardeners or not, to look into practices that ensure healthy soil, air, and water. Do your best to educate yourself on the potential hazards of anything that you might apply to your lawn, to your gardens, to your plants, anything that may run off into the water supply. Even organic options have their risks. There are many, many resources available out there to provide education and information. Many of those are geared toward farmers, but backyard gardeners can find valuable information, support, and connection through many of these resources. Organizations like OFA, the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association, and PASA, the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, and many other states have similar organizations, as well as organizations like Beyond Pesticides, a nonprofit headquartered in Washington, D.C., which works with allies in protecting public health and the environment to lead the transition to a world free of toxic pesticides. These types of organizations are fantastic resources for gardeners, farmers, and concerned citizens in general. And if you have concerns about your own soil and water quality, there are options. Phytoremediation is one. Phytoremediation refers to the use of living plants to reduce, degrade, or remove toxic residue from the soil or groundwater. While the concept might sound unapproachable to the backyard gardener, there are actually quite a few common plants that are excellent phytoremediators. One great option for the backyard gardener is sunflowers. Sunflowers were most notably used in combination with other plants to help after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, to help actually remove radioactive 
radioactive elements from the soil and water surrounding the disaster site. Studies have also shown that sunflowers can effectively take up cadmium and other heavy metals from contaminated soil. Another plant utilized after the Chernobyl disaster was hemp. Industrial hemp was planted to uptake highly toxic strontium and radioactive cesium. Industrial hemp was also utilized in Italy after a farmer discovered that his pasture grazed sheep had high levels of dioxin, a persistent organic pollutant that was coming from a nearby steel mill. He planted the industrial hemp due to its ability to absorb those toxins from the soil. The willow is another phytoremediation superstar. Specific toxin accumulations will vary by willow subspecies, but in general, they have great potential to accumulate excess arsenic, cadmium, lead, copper, zinc, and more. Poplar trees are being researched for their ability to absorb carbon tetrachloride, a well-known carcinogen, and degrade petroleum hydrocarbons like benzene and paint thinner. Native prairie grasses, including big blue stem and switchgrass, are being studied for their ability to pull up persistent herbicides like atrazine from the soil and contaminated water. Other known phytoremediators include alpin pennycress, Indian mustard, canola, and miscanthus grass, and research into phytoremediation seems to be growing. In the Great Lakes area, there are over 20,000 trees planted in 16 different phytoremediation sites. One can only hope that work like this continues to get funding. And for my part, I know that I will certainly be planting some of these plants along the borders of my own property. For areas with immediate soil concerns, raised beds may offer a quicker fix. I wasn't sure if above ground raised beds offered an applicable solution to some of the soil contamination problems. So I did a little digging and I came across a research project done by UC San Diego in conjunction with a local community garden. The team from UC tested produce levels grown in the gardens for heavy metal contaminants like lead, arsenic, and cadmium. And one of the things that the team found was that the produce tested from the raised beds, even though the beds lacked a boundary layer between the fill dirt and the contaminated soil underneath, was that the produce tested had no traces of heavy metal toxins. Based on those findings, the recommendation was that all seasonal produce in those gardens should be grown in raised beds. Now, I know on this channel, I do go on a lot about caring for and improving your existing native soil, but in sites with contamination, building raised beds and bringing in soil that is safe from another site is certainly a better option, at least in the short term. I truly believe everyone should be utilizing a rainwater collection system. While this obviously isn't a solution for events like acid rain or immediate contaminants, overall, it may well be a much better option for folks than relying on well water and certainly a better option than some municipal water sources. Rainwater collection regulations vary from state to state, but it is legal to collect rainwater in all 50 states. We are on a well here, but I have tested our water and I know that it has various contaminants, including glyphosate. So the more rainwater I can collect for watering my garden, the better. I've shown my setup in other videos, but we basically just use these repurposed totes and these used to contain molasses for animal feed. And we've got them situated up high so that the hoses can be gravity fed. I also keep extra 55 gallon barrels to fill once my totes get full. Often you can get rain barrels and rain barrel converter kits from your local soil and water district. Now for those of you who, like me, use a lot of compost or composted manure in your gardens, to the extent that you can, make or produce your own. Depending on the size of your gardens, it can certainly be challenging to produce enough, but use everything you have access to. Collect your grass clippings and your leaf mulch, collect from neighbors who wanna get rid of it, collect all your kitchen scraps, all of your food waste, sign up for programs like Chip Drop, and remember that it does not take a whole lot of space to keep chickens or rabbits in areas that allow it. Both are great sources for animal poo. A bonus, something I just found out, is that rabbit manure actually has four times the amount of nutrients that horse or cow manure does. 
and is twice as rich as chicken manure. Plus, unlike cow, horse, or chicken manure, which is considered hot and has to be composted before putting it on your garden, otherwise it'll burn up your plants, rabbit manure is not and can be used as is. But if you understandably need to outsource some of your compost, some of your manure, mulches like hay or straw, just know your source. It is important to understand that any of these products can potentially be contaminated with persistent herbicides. The residues of these herbicides can affect the growth of sensitive plants and they can remain active anywhere from months to years depending on the conditions. These herbicide residues can severely injure legumes, solanaceous crops, and other broadleaf plants in particular. If you're planning on using an outside source for any of these things, whether it's compost, animal manure, hay, or straw, always ask first what the fields have been treated with and or what the animals have been fed. If they're grazing on pasture that's been treated with persistent herbicides or have been fed hay that's been treated with anything. And if you're concerned about potential herbicide contamination, an at-home bioassay is relatively easy to conduct. The University of Florida Extension recommends conducting the bioassay by taking four to eight samples from the compost or composted manure and filling an ordinary garden pot or plastic cup with drainage holes. You'll also want to prepare four to eight cups using a bagged potting mix that does not contain animal manure or compost. These will act as your control. In all of the cups, plant two to four pea or tomato seeds, as those tend to be particularly sensitive, and grow them on as you normally would. Monitor the seedlings regularly to see if herbicide symptoms develop. Symptoms will often appear in the newest tissues and manifest as improper leaf formation and expansion. Higher concentrations will typically result in stem twisting or even root formation on the stems. Another way to test manure and to test straw and hay is to make a slurry of equal parts manure and water and let set for an hour in the case of manure or overnight for hay or straw. Water half of your seedlings with the manure water or strained water from the hay or straw and water half your seedlings with plain water. In the case of contamination, symptoms should start to show up in a few days. Opting for professional lab testing of your soil or water is an option as well. Many soil testing labs offer tests for soil contaminants. RX Soil offers an easy to use testing service for heavy metals, including arsenic, barium, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, selenium, and silver, as well as tests for herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and glyphosate specifically. Brookside Laboratories offers an array of soil and environmental testing services, including drinking water and groundwater analysis and pesticide analysis. And Holmes Laboratory offers heavy metal testing for soil and compost. Now for anyone watching this, if you have additional resources or advice for people who are dealing with soil and water contamination, please share that information in the video comments below. Clean water and air and healthy soil are something that we all benefit from and they connect us all. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.